Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to everybody online as well. I hope there are there anybody online. There's no. Okay, good. So, welcome to everybody online. Good morning to you as well. The teens, I believe, with their parents, are in Thames Valley, and the preteens are in the service today. So, welcome, guys. Um, Right, so we are in the series about uh, men and women in the Bible and the divine harmony. And unlike last time when I spoke about uh, Deborah and Barak, I thought I'm not going to allow Malcolm to spoil my sermon again by telling him what I'm preaching about. <laughs> See, in case you were reading the Watford Word, the answers are not there like last time. <laughs> No, I'm just teasing. So these in the Watford Word, we're moving on towards Jesus and women. And uh, Malcolm wrote up a really nice summary in the Watford Word about Jesus and women, um, what he was teaching about men and women, his, uh, the significant women in, in the life of Jesus, uh, some women who were following Jesus. Uh, Jesus referenced women as part of his teaching and in parables, um, some women who encountered Jesus. During his ministry, there's quite a long list of them, and we're going to look at uh, at one woman today and her interactions with uh, Jesus. And her name is Martha. Now, if you hear Martha, 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 why twice? We'll see soon. If you hear Martha or Martha, Martha, what thoughts come to mind? What do you, if you're familiar with this woman in in uh, the New Testament? What thoughts come to mind? What do you think of? What do you know about? What do we know about Martha? What do we associate with her? Anybody? Any? Uh, house proud. House proud? <laughs> You'd have to translate that to me. <laughs> what, what, what does house proud mean? Uh, she's concerned about, she, she wants everything to be right. She wants everything to be right. Ah, okay, yeah, everything must just be just right when she entertains people and have, have people into her house. Yes, Lucy. You can identify, yeah. Make sure people Yeah. Yeah, it's, you can identify with her. Yeah, that's very nice. Yes, you kind of a liaison. She was unhappy with her sister. We'll, we'll soon see why. Yes, anybody else? She wanted Jesus' attention. Yeah, for why? Why did she want his attention? Right, yeah, the food was more important than other things, and uh, she wanted Jesus' attention. All right, it is uh, quite, it's quite interesting. I mean, uh, s- some people talk about, oh, moaning Martha. You know, they, they kind of associate that with, uh, she was complaining, she was a complaining one. Or I hope today that we can set the record straight, because in my studies... And preparing for this, I realized, wow, it's, it's interesting how we sometimes focus on one thing instead of really thinking about what we learn in the scriptures uh, about this woman called Martha. Now, this name Martha is quite interesting. What's in a name? Martha, in, it could, could either be Hebrew, and in Hebrew, Martha is derived from the name Martha or Martha, which means bitter or sorrowful. So that's one view of Martha. Or it could could be Aramaic, where Martha means the lady or the mistress, derived from the word Martha, which means mistress or lady of the house. So it's interesting, two quite contrasting. The one is bitter sorrowful, the other one is kind of the lady of the house. A very nice name. Um, Whether it's Hebrew or Aramaic, I don't know, but the two passages we're going to look at today actually contrasts those two things quite quite nicely. And I would like to believe that maybe the name was more Aramaic because Aramaic was the common language among the Jews of the day. Jesus mostly spoke Aramaic. Um, and, and, and a lot of the people of the times, the Jews of the time, spoke Aramaic. So maybe it was the Aramaic rather than the Hebrew name. But anyway, what's in the name? If you want to know anything more about uh, questions about nominative determinism, ask Malcolm or Leon. They seem to know something about it from last week's lesson. Or you can go and ask, um, what's this guy's name? Shakespeare. He said, what's in a name? A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. 
So let's not zoom in too much on what her name actually means or not. And look at what the scriptures say. We'll start in Luke chapter 10. If you want to take your Bibles out, you're welcome to follow along. I'll be reading from the New International Version, the NIV, with the UK English and spelling in it. This is the first interaction that we, that we read about between uh, Jesus and Martha. So it says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. I think if Jesus was British, you could probably hear him go, Martha, Martha, tut, tut, <laughs> when he said that. Um, and, and that's where... The, the, the kind of the, the title comes from and where the, the thinking about Martha comes from. She's the one that Jesus said to her, ah, Martha, Martha. And it seems that that description has, uh, has stuck. I can also relate to uh, Martha. Uh, it seems like she had a lot of uh, distractions and decision stress in her life. Uh, I get easily distracted and distracted by various things from what really matters. I allow myself to be distracted and I have to be really be passionate about something and really get into it for it to really grab my, grab my attention. So I can, I can quite relate to her. Uh, I don't like having too many things around me and, and too many things to decide about. And what shall I focus on? Should it be this or should it be that? Uh, like even going shopping. Um, my wife likes going to places like Waitrose and... M&S and Morrison's and Sainsbury's and other supermarket brands are available uh, because you've got choice and you can browse and all the different kinds of breads they have and you know I like going to Little or Aldi where there's only one of everything <laughs> you don't have to choose the only choice is do I want it or do I not want it <laughs> do I need peanut butter yes okay smooth or crunchy smooth always smooth okay that's it you take the peanut butter you go very simple uh, I get so distracted when I walk in and it's like, and why are there 10 different kinds of peanut butter? I mean, it's not that complicated. And I would stand there for 10 minutes figuring out, why should I take this one and not that one? And so, anyway, if we think about and, and, and look at this uh, passage, uh, I like the pattern that, that uh, Malcolm follows. And he says, what can we learn about Martha, about the woman in the story? What can we learn about Jesus? And what can we learn about God? And we learn best when we learn in community. So let's talk about Martha. What do we learn and we see about Martha in this story? If we look a bit beyond and think about really what, what, what do we see here more than what we already shared in the beginning? Exactly, yeah, she was very hospitable, and, and she was welcoming, and in a way, she was an enabler for Jesus' ministry, because if she wasn't opening her home and providing food for people, because, you know, if, you, if there's food, people tend to come, especially if it's free. It's like, yeah, come for a meal, yeah, sure, <laughs> to say when and where. She was a, an enabler who would allow people to come so that they could hear Jesus teach, and she was obviously very hospitable. Any other thoughts? Leo? Yeah. I think um, the fact that she, you know, she, she stepped up, she wasn't the main child, opened it from the environment of her father. Yeah, she had a, a really great relationship with Jesus, that she was, she was able to tell him exactly how she felt. And even appealing to Jesus, oh, can you talk to my sister? Maybe her relationship with her sister Mary wasn't that great. We don't know. Um, but certainly, her relationship with Jesus was good enough that she, she was able to tell him, this is how I feel, and could you help me with this? Any other thoughts? 
Go. Well, the role of the woman in those days, they have to do what she did. They have to do what she did. She was focused on the role that she had to do. So she was filling her role, and then but the other thing that she could not understand why Mary was one. I don't think Mary was supposed to even sit at Jesus' feet. Oh, that's a good point. Point. Yeah, maybe she was also supposed to be helping. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Culturally, it was yeah. kind of a yeah. It wasn't culturally the norm, and 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 acceptable. That's a good point. Yes. She was. Uh, she was serving. Yes, she had, a, she had a servant heart. She had a heart that was willing to, to work hard and be concerned about, you know, are the people, the people taken care of? Um, anybody else? Any other thoughts about Martha? So, interesting. Um, she, uh, she was worried and troubled. So, not by her own admission, but... Jesus noticed that he could see through it. He could see that this was really bothering her, and she was worrying about it, and it, and it troubled her. Um, which is why she maybe why she why, why she appealed to to Jesus. And she asked Jesus interesting questions. She says, "Don't you care that my sister has left me? Don't you care?" Now, there's some interesting lessons here for us. For ourselves, if we think about Martha, I was still thinking, reading through this, and I was thinking, yeah, in what way can I sometimes be like Martha? And maybe you know, we can ask ourselves that question. It's easy to say, ah, oh, Martha, yeah, you know, she was a complainer and she was this and that. And but how can we sometimes be like Martha? Do we sometimes feel like asking God, God? Don't you care? Don't you see what's happening? Don't you see the burden that I'm bearing? God, don't you see that I'm worried and troubled? Don't you care about me? We can sometimes be just like Martha, wondering if God cares, if we're struggling with something or going through tough times or some, or, or some challenges. I think the other lesson I thought here is I thought about, yeah, I can, I can be distracted quite easily by all kinds of things. And I thought, what was Jesus' point here about her distraction? When, uh, when he said, um, you worried, you're upset about many things uh, in verse, uh, what does it say? Um, verse 14, Martha was distracted by the preparations. So she was clearly distracted. I thought, what distracts me from the one thing that Jesus mentions. He says, Martha, you're distracted by so many things. And I think that's a good question to ask ourselves. What distracts us from what really matters? The little things in life, whether it's worries, like Martha, or whether it's valid concerns, things that need to be taken care of, but that always come in the way of more important things. What do we think? What was the one thing that Jesus talks about that he, when he told Martha, Martha, there's only one thing you need? He said a few to things. Listen to, to listen to him? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. To, listen. Be to be in his presence. So to listen to him, to be in his presence. Yes, right. To come as we are, yeah. Yeah, so the one thing is, do not, you know, I need to be perfect before I can come to Jesus. Yeah, good point. Yes. yes. Because if she, if she cooks, she knows already how to cook. She doesn't learn new things. Or if she sits at the master's feet, she doesn't learn new things. She learns the gospel. Yeah. That's a really good point. Uh, the, this, uh, the wording here of Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus the, the way that's phrased and, and, and the way of speaking is of, of typically of a disciple of a rabbi. So Jesus was the rabbi, and someone who would sit at his feet would be a disciple of the rabbi. So Mary was acting like a disciple. So it would be to, to learn, to be a disciple of Jesus. 
So we can probably think of more things, but all these things is to follow Jesus, to learn from him, to be his disciple, um, to, to, uh, uh, to listen to him. All these things is, is contained in that one thing where Jesus said, you know what, what is really important? And then what is distracting us from that one thing? And it's easy to say, oh yeah, Martha, Martha. But when Jesus said, Stefan, Stefan, she's so distracted. You know what the most important thing is. Why do you allow all these other things to distract you from me and from spending time with me and from your mission and from your, from your spiritual focus and, and your relationship with me? A thought for, for I think, every one of us to, to think for ourselves. <coughs> what is it that distracts us from Jesus? Jesus, in a way, calls, um, uh, calls Martha to a choice. He says, make a decision. And it's a simple decision. There's not a lot of choices. It's a bit like little or old, you know. You either choose, I want it or I don't want it. I want Jesus or I want all the distractions of all the other supermarkets. Where there's 20 varieties. How can we change our choices to put away the distractions and choose the one thing that Jesus was talking about today? A few things are needed, or indeed, only one. Don't worry and be upset about all the other many things, because there's a never an end to those things. I've got a never-ending to-do list. I don't know if you are in the same position or you feel the same sometimes, but it seems like I could fill my day with my to-do list. And it just never ends. If you're not the same, I would appreciate any help. So if you're looking for something to fill up your time, come and have a chat. So that's some thoughts about, uh, about, um, about Mary, Martha, and, uh, and, and Jesus in this, uh, in this passage. Let's move on to John chapter 11. We don't know how much later, but this, this is some time later, I and mean, it's a fairly long passage. So we're going to split it up in a, in a, over a few screens, but I'm going to read the whole story, uh, or most of the story, cut out the little bits where Jesus interacts with his disciples. And it's the story of Lazarus and the resurrection of Lazarus. Now, of course, Lazarus was the brother of Mary and Martha. So later on, we find this event. This is uh, very close to the time when Jesus uh, approaches Jerusalem uh, for his crucifixion. And we pick it up in John 11, in verse 1. So it says, Now a man named Lazarus was ill. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay ill, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is ill. When he heard this, Jesus said, This illness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed where he was two more days, and then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. That's verse uh, 7. We're going to skip uh, to verse 17. In, the, in between verses, there's some discussion between Jesus and his disciples about oh, why go back, etc., etc. We pick it up in verse uh, 17, when Jesus arrives in Bethany. So on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the res resurrection and the life. 
The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Verse 28. After Martha had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Verse 38. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there for four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took, the, took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth round his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. It's quite a long story, but uh, I notice quite a shift here. So let's think about um, what do we learn about Martha, Jesus, God, and their interactions. And uh, if you want to go back to any of the scriptures, uh, just ask me, I can flick between the, between the slides. But uh, what do we see? Any thoughts? What do we see about Martha? What do we see? That, do we see anything that's different from the previous uh, passage? She's very committed to believing who Jesus is. She's committed to believing who Jesus is. Yeah, she had great faith. Anybody else? Joe. So her needs had to be met by being uh, comforted by the people in the house, uh, by Mary. Yeah. Oh, and she wasn't focused on that. She was not focused. It was not on her needs. To be met by her needs, but by the needs of Jesus. Whatever she wants to, however she wants to interact with him, but she's not allowed to focus on him in her needs. She, want, she wanted to focus on Jesus to meet her needs. Do we think she listened to what Jesus said to her the first time? Has something changed? Where would she have been the first time? Back at the house, serving people food and making sure everything is perfect and everything. Now she goes to Jesus. Where's Mary? Mary's back at the house. <laughs> Where Martha now goes first to Jesus. I thought, wow, this is quite a contrast. What happened to moaning Martha? What happened to serving Martha? What happened to Martha who was distracted by you know, all the people and taking care of their needs? She was the first. She went out. She wasn't even waiting at the house. She, maybe she heard that people told her, oh, Jesus is coming. Or maybe, you know, she sent word to Jesus. Maybe she went out like the, like the father of the prodigal son, looking out for his son. Maybe she went out on the road a few times every day. It's like, wonder, is he coming? Is he coming? I think that's quite a shift. Any other thoughts? What do we see? So I like that uh, Martha in the passages here. Um, so interesting, we see in uh, 
So in verse 20, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. So that's the first thing that I noticed. She went out to meet him. Um, Martha makes the great confession in verse 27. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who's come into the world. What is the most important thing? Last time Jesus said, Martha, you know what? There's just one thing that's more important than anything else. What can be more important than that? That believing that Jesus is the Son of God. He is to come into the world. He's the Messiah. He was the promised one. And then going even beyond that, Martha believed in the resurrection. And she even confesses that. Is, is this the first time? Huh? Is, this, is this the first declaration of Jesus' Messiahship? Oh, that is a good question. Is it the first one? It could be, because it's very early. Because Thomas came later. Thomas was in John 20. Peter was also later, I think. Good, that's a really good question. So uh, Leon asks, uh, for those online as well, Leon asks, is this the first confession and acknowledgement of Jesus as the Messiah? If it is, it's something significant, which I overlooked, which is kind of... Now, I, I'd love to know. That I'm, I'm going to look up the answer to this. I'm going to, I'm going to find it. Uh, we don't have time now. But if it is, it is as significant as the fact that the first person to see Jesus alive was Mary, a woman. And if it is the first confession of Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God, well, John the Baptist, I guess, yeah. would have been the first one, but not among his disciples. That kind of, he was the prophet. He said, he told people, no, that's him, but nobody believed him. So I think of, except John, who, who was the prophet who was told by God himself, to, that this is him, and you know, you need to spread the word. This may have been there. Yeah, that's a really good point. I'll, I'll go and find the answer. It will be significant if it is. It's significant anyway. It's one of, definitely one of the early confessions. Right, any, uh, any other thoughts? Any other? What did I put in my notes here? I, I kind of like the fact that there's still an element of, the, of that. How when, when they get to the tomb, right? and then they smell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like everything must be clean and hygienic and neat and uh, yeah. <laughs> so can't have any smelly people walking around around Jesus, you know. It's uh, I mean he's he's the rabbi. <laughs> Things must be ready and nice for him. That's a good point. What do we learn about Jesus? Oh, any other thoughts about Martha? Yes, son. Yeah, so Jesus really loved this whole family. He loved Lazarus. He loved uh, um, both Mary and Martha equally, even though they were very different. Uh, he loved them equally. Um, pardon? He makes a big point of it. He makes a big point of it. Yeah, yeah, he does. Um, the other thing that's interesting, remember the first time Martha asked Jesus, don't you care? Uh, so... Here, when Jesus arrives, she doesn't directly say, don't you care, in verse 21, but she does say, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Again, it shows great faith. She already decided, you know what? He could have saved her. He could do a miracle. She already believed that if he was there, he could have saved him. Now, who this time says, don't you care? So what does Mary reach the place where Jesus was and saw him? She fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So Mary, in a way, also says like in this time, oh, don't you care, Jesus? Don't you care about us? I thought you loved us. No, I thought you loved Lazarus. I thought you loved me. It always amazes me in verse 35, there, it says, Jesus wept. To the point where they said, see how Jesus loved him. And then, uh, when he goes to the tomb, again in verse 38, it says, Jesus once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. Why would Jesus weep 
and be deeply moved if he knew that, Jesus, that Lazarus was going to be raised from the dead. I mean, I can understand crying over dead people. You know, we do cry. You know, we go to funerals. I go to other people's funerals that I cry. You know, <laughs> people that... Uh, we haven't asked the Lord to raise him. Yet. Maybe, but he knew. He said from the beginning it was going to be raised from the dead. Yeah. So he knew it. David? <coughs> It shows his humanity, yeah? Okay. Well, like you have mentioned, you know, for that, what you need to do that closely, so you can ask the question, you know, well, I see better than you can say, so yes, I have it. I think Leon says you just saw how, how, you know, he got there. The problem was not really moved by the pain and suffering of Mary and Martha. That moved his heart so much. He was so pain to see his close friends and family. I'm not sure that was that. It moved him to tears. That's what I think as well. I, I think he wasn't crying about Lazarus who was dead. He was crying in empathy and sympathy with seeing the people's pain. You know, and the, 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 the question that Mary and Martha asked, don't you care? It clearly showed he did care. He cared about their pain. He cared about the, their suffering. Jesus cares. He cares about our pain and our suffering and whatever challenges we go through. He feels with us. Even though he knows whatever the better outcome will be, he still cares and he still feels with us. Any other thoughts? What do you learn about Jesus? I mean, there's a lot, but uh, yes, uh, you may. I think it was interesting that Jesus is still very much in the same spot. Right. And um, and if you're someone who feels really lost at this point of someone who doesn't care about you, when you feel that so immensely, it's sometimes got to be a bit cranky. And it just gives them the wonderful little harmony that you needed to ensure that that happened. And I feel so that. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of. Um, yeah, I'm trying. Okay, I'm trying to think. How, how do I summarize that? Especially for the people online who didn't hear the question. Um, but in summary, so Jesus was stopped in his tracks almost before he arrived at the village, and and then he stayed there for a while as people came to him, um, and showed his connection and compassion with. Uh, you know, his main mission wasn't to just go and get Lazarus out of the tomb. It was about the people. They being there and for them to see what that happening, what happens, and for God to be glorified, rather than you know it wasn't just about the event. Um, so I think I missed a few things of what you said there, but 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 in summary, um, what do we learn about God in this story? Any thoughts? I mean, who, who raised Lazarus from the dead? Was it Jesus? Or was it God, the Father? It was Jesus as God, but also, what did he do? He prayed. Even though he knew, he still prayed before raising him.
him instead. And the creativity can work in that way. He needs us. He needed strength. Yeah, he needed strength from, from God for, for the miracle. How do we apply some of this to ourselves today? Um, I think it's amazing. I thought about, one thing I thought about, it's, it's amazing if we do choose, and I, I honestly believe, and I hope we can set the record straight on Martha today, that if we do choose to say, you know what, let's forget about all the distractions and choose the most important thing, she chose Jesus, that Jesus will work in our lives, like he worked in Martha's life. We, I think the most, most amazing thing is that God did a miracle here, of course, which is like amazing, raising someone from the dead. But we can easily say, oh, you know, that was back then, in the time of Jesus. The question is, does God still do miracles today? And when we see them, are we like Mary and Martha that glorify God and that see the glory of God in that miracle? I was uh, deeply moved and inspired. Um, it was about a week or two ago. One of my best friends at, at, uh, at university, uh, he, did the, he did the toast on the bride and the groom at my wedding, at our wedding. Um, his name is Andre. Uh, we, we, we've been friends for forever. We spent many hours in the cafeteria playing hearts uh, and sometimes studying together as well. <laughs> um, one of my really good friends. But after finishing our studies, we actually worked together in Pretoria for about two years, two, three years. And, and then he moved away and then I moved away. And, but we, we're still in contact after so many years. Um, I met his children only a few times over these years. I met his uh, daughters when they were fairly young about four or five years old, and then again when they're about 10 years old, 10 or 12 years old. Um, and then again, quite interestingly, uh, when we were in South Africa for, after my mom's funeral, when we were stuck there for COVID. And one of his daughters is called Janae. She has a stutter. And she's been stuttering ever since I can remember. When I saw her as a five-year-old, a six-year-old, I think, when I saw her roughly around 10 or 11, she had a stutter. And it was quite a, st a stutter where, you know, she, she couldn't say one sentence without a stutter in it. Um, when, uh, in two years ago, when we were in South Africa, we were staying at my in my dad's house, and it's quite amazing. There were these boxes in the garage marked with a, a surname, De Beer. I was like, oh, that's interesting. My university friend is called De Beer. And then one day someone showed up and said, oh, I've come to fetch, fetch my boxes. And Diesel was outside and, uh, talking to her. And this was actually my brother's daughter's flatmate at, at uni. And uh, Lil brings her in and says, Stefan, can you remember who this is? And it turns out this is Janay De Beer, uh, my best friend's daughter, who by coincidence ended up in the same flat as my brother's daughter at uni. Anyway, by coincidence, God incidents, who knows? That's the last time I saw her, we had a conversation, still the stutter. Two weeks ago, she posted a message on Facebook, a voice message, sharing her testimony. She said, I cannot, you know, I don't normally speak in public because I had a stutter, but as you can hear now, I want to share this with the whole world. A friend of mine, we were together, and she said, I'm going to pray for you. And a miracle happened. At that moment, my stutter disappeared, and now it's, uh, what is it, three months ago or something like that? Do you remember these words? Um, anyway, it's, it's a few months ago, and she said, and my stutter is still gone. And she, say, she shares this whole testimony without a single stutter, and she says she hasn't stuttered for how many months it was, mm. after a friend prayed for her. Now, in miracles, th these miracles are not just in the times of Jesus. Now, this is not someone raised from the dead, but this is someone who's been to speech therapists and doctors, etc., her whole life. And in name, God did a miracle in her life. And she glorified God. And I saw through this that God still, God cares. God still wants to do miracles in our lives. Because he wants to reveal his glory to us. And then will we acknowledge it when we see it? Uh, let's wrap it up here very quickly in, um, 
The last bit about Martha, in John 12, this is six days before the Passover, six days before Jesus goes to the cross, and we're going to have a communion after, after this. So this is Jesus on his way to the cross to be crucified. He stops in Bethany. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, where he lived and he died and lived, <laughs> where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. And who was serving the dinner? <laughs> Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about half a liter of pure nard and expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Now this whole lesson here about Jesus being the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, and being anointed in, in high priesthood. Great lesson, great Bible study for another time. But there was something in this dinner and Martha serving that struck me. What do we think about this? Is, is it the same? Did she just revert back to the past, or is it different here? What do we think? Liesl. Uh, she's rounded, she's complete. The serving and the food and the dinner, it wasn't really the issue. You can still do that. And Martha was still, she still had that, Jesus didn't say stop being a servant, stop being so serving, Martha, you know, you're serving too much, you know, don't be a servant, Jesus was a servant leader, That's not, that was not the point, point. and sometimes we miss the point, when we read that first story, we think, oh yeah, it's about the serving, you know, and she's work, doing all the hard work, and Mary's doing nothing, that was not the point. The point was her heart and her priorities and her focus on Jesus. And I think, yes, it's mentioned here, but it's probably very different from that first time. And I hope that we can set the record straight. Next time we hear Martha, Martha, we can think not about the complaining Martha, Martha, but about Martha, Martha, the one who believed that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God, who could do a miracle, show the glory of God by raising someone from the dead, so that she could confess her that, that faith, be the first, one of the first ones to acknowledge Jesus. So that she could be the one that goes first to see him and put him first in her life. As we have the communion now, uh, let's think about that. Let's think about when Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And it's a question to all of us. Do you believe this? Because when we have the communion, that's really what it's all about. Let's pray. Dear God, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your incredible son and uh, his life on earth, his interactions with people, God, that we can learn from. Thank you that you and your son Jesus cares about us. That you care about us to the point you were willing to sacrifice your own son because you love us so much. Thank you, Jesus, you, that you care about us, that you were willing to give up your life. Father, as we have this bread that represents his body and the fruit of the vine that represents his blood, pour it out for the forgiveness of our sins so that we can live eternally. We thank you for that, God. And we pray that you bless us. Jesus.